I try to adjust my screen so I can actually see what's going on here. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, I am going to wait for a few minutes here to make sure that the stream is actually active. I have another screen open. Looks like that's starting now. Yeah, a little delay there, but that's not bad. Yeah. All right. Cool. So um, getting that distraction out of my ear here, I'm going to try a switcheroo here. Boom. Look at that. All right. Hey, everybody. DJ, the Citrix coach here. Actually, um, this is a funny story. I'm actually thinking of changing the name Citrix coach because pretty soon I'm going to be doing a lot more than just Citrix. So it's a uh, kind of important to know that i guess in the long run but for now we're still focused on citrix so that's what we're going to do um so, all right cool that's working and like i said i'm just testing out a streaming software here called be live and just making sure that it's working as i expect and so far so good this is all web-based so We'll see if this glitches out on us, whatever, like the last thing I were doing with OBS that just was a nightmare. You can see my uh, half dead thread wrapper in the back there. It's one of the reasons why I'm probably not 100%. I'm still running on a very old, well, very old um, <laughs> uh, i7 3770K. It's been overclocked for the seven, eight years or whatever that it's been live but uh it's still running so a uh, big shout out to my friends at nvidia that uh actually one of them had given me a card a while ago for a thank you for a blog post um that card happens to be a titan uh, <laughs> and so it is still running in there and that's the only thing that's been keeping the system alive but uh hey i think i'm probably digressing a bit too much let's get on with it shall we all right. So while we're here, let's go ahead and talk. Uh, first off, what's in the book? So this is the book. Be a Citrix hero, rescue your users from poor performance and advance your career. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of fun. So basically a couple of things you should know about the book. Uh, first off, this is something that I've been working on a little bit for the last few years it came out of a presentation that I called the dirty dozen. The dirty dozen was a group of 12 recommendations based off of roughly 350 or so of things that I was finding that were just not quite right in the Citrix world. As I traveled around as a Citrix consultant, then um, working with Citrix and a couple other companies, but the more I traveled around, the more I found that was that there really was some gaps in understanding that kept coming up over and over and over again. And so when these things repeated themselves, I noticed the pattern. So I spent about a month and a half collating all the um, recommendations that I've been making over all the documents and all the things that I'd sent, all the spreadsheets, all the uh, print documents, all these kind of things that I'd sent out. And I, I parsed all those into a, another spreadsheet. And like I said, there was about 350, actually initially 335. I remember that number. And then um, pretty soon that increased to 350. So I parsed all of those and found that there were a bunch of themes that kept repeating. And so I took 12 of those themes, some of which were individual recommendations, and kind of ranked those and the ones that were happening the most. And I did a presentation called The Dirty Dozen, which is something that I'll be making available here on YouTube soon. Uh, it's just a matter of you know, getting the logistics figured out for that as it was a rather long presentation most time I did it and I wanna try and make it a little bit more uh, consumable. So we'll do that. But the book itself is based out of 
of those recommendations that I was making in that Dirty Dozen presentation, there were a couple of things that I felt people should really do. And so I, I, my initial thought was to say, okay, let's do 12 chapters in the book. The idea was that we would have a, uh, a chapter a month, basically. And so we were trying a membership at the time called the Citrix Hero Program. And so the, the idea there was we would actually do a lesson every month. And so I would write a chapter of the book, send that out, and then do a, a lesson. And so we got through about six of these. Uh, well, let me take that back. We got through about seven of these. <laughs> and on about the eighth one, I was just not feeling like it was really something that was really something I wanted to do every month, if that makes sense. All right. That's really not the direction I wanted to go with this. And I'll get deeper into that maybe at the end of this presentation. But basically what I decided was, you know what, let's just stop that program and I will focus on just getting this into a more uh, wider format, like more people can have. And so what I did was I took these uh, recommendations that I was making and said, okay, what are the things that are gonna have the highest impact for the lowest amount of effort possible. And I took those and put those into this book. And so what this has is some key chapters that are all based around these um, recommendations that are typically easier to do, have a little less effort involved and have the high impacts. Now there's a reason I did that. And this is actually pretty important to, to know. And that is that, um, I really wanted it to be friendly for the administrator that is having to do a lot of different things for their job. And so let's say she is somebody who has been just kind of um, interested in advancing from maybe a help desk and went into a systems engineer and they have asked her to go ahead and, and learn Citrix because nobody else knows it. And somebody has to know this environment that's that's been put in place by maybe a consultant or something like that. And so that's what she's tasked with doing. So, you know, it's, that's that's the, the kind of audience I have in mind is somebody like that. Um, and it doesn't have to be she, you know, most often it was uh, he in, in the IT world, unfortunately. But, you know, this is the kind of the thoughts I have is like, I want this to be approachable so that even if you don't have a detailed background in Citrix, you just know kind of the basics, you can still be successful and still do things that are high grade consultant level results. That's what we're talking about in this book. Now, um, interestingly enough, a colleague from Citrix actually showed some concern about me giving away that high quality of, of presentation of, of data. Well, here's the thing. Every, almost everything in this book, with an exception we'll talk about here in a minute, is from recommendations that are widely out there. In fact, I have a lot of sources in this book, uh, so much so that that I have actually a uh, special website set up that's just to handle the links that are in this book and make sure there's any updates that I can put those there so that, um, because web links break sometimes and things like that, So, but there's so many references outside this is all information that's out there, folks. That's the thing about this. So I just wanted to put this into a consumable format that says things the way that uh, not only I've been saying for a long time, but that I, I felt was maybe a little bit more approachable as far as how it was presented. And I'm actually really thankful that I've gotten a lot of feedback that that is exactly what has happened, that there's a lot of um, uh, people that have said, you know, this is actually pretty easy to consume and that's exactly what I wanted. So yeah, that's, that's at a, at a nutshell, the, the reason why I've done this. Now, the thing that is the number one thing, and that's why I put it in the number one chapter. And this has been something that's been made freely available for a long time. I just did some edits to the chapter and some updates and things like that made it prettier and easier to read and put it right into this book. And that is that you need to optimize your operating system. If you just go out of the box, just the way it comes, you're not going to get good performance. Remember, when Windows is shipped, it's shipped in such a way that it is compatible. Compatibility 
is not fine tuning. And so you have a lot of services, uh, drivers, things like that, that are there in the operating system. They're running, they're active because that's where <laughs> what compatibility comes from, right? You have to have those things going. Well, if you're in a virtual environment, you're not going to need easily 30 to 50% of these things. And so over the years, we've been developing, you know, say we like our, the Citrix community in general have been developing fine tunings that we've been putting forward out there into blogs and things like that. And initially, when we first started doing these, tuning the Windows operating system usually took several days because there's a lot of things to click. And then some of us figured out, okay, we can script this. Um, like my friend Pablo and some people like that, that really did some great work early on with the optimization processes of, of making scripts or easier and easier and easier. Well, someone you're going to meet in uh, a few months or yeah, about a month or so uh, is going to tell you about Citrix optimizer, which has been a game changer for this because with a couple of clicks, you're able to do all the things that were recommended by Citrix for a long time. And the cool thing about this is that with every update of windows 10, which there have been many, I don't think people have a full grasp of just how many updates to windows there have been since the kind of Microsoft said, okay, it's going to be 10 from now on. Well, there's been a lot of iterations of 10. Um, and each one of those has little quirks, little things that are involved with it that are, I keep hearing Doug DeMiro in my head going quirks and features, but that's just another, that's another, that's another YouTube guy. Anyway, <laughs> um, so these quirks, these little things that, that are unique to that build of Windows in a virtual machine, very often pretty much worthless, or maybe they have worth, but it's only a limited worth and you need to just be aware of it. This means a lot of things like the, um, the metro applications as they're called or, or whatever they're calling it now the, the the things that come packaged with windows that aren't strictly x86 applications well getting those out of the the system completely is actually a lot of times beneficial so that's an example there's a lot of things a lot of registry settings a lot of uh, services you want to make sure are turned off those sort of things and so the citrix optimizer lets you do that with either the defaults or some community developed templates or what I really love about it, you can develop your own. Um, now, again, I'm very interested in quick actions that make a difference. And when it comes to operating systems on a virtual environment, it, and this is especially true if you're running uh, VDI or desktops, the more you have just out of the box systems, the more resources are being wasted in your data center. I've literally seen just doing the optimizer, saving enough resources to justify not having to buy an entire physical host just from a literally 30 second thing of running Citrix optimizer. It's that much of an impact is potential. So like I said, I just wanted to make this really easy download, select, click done. That usually is the way Citrix optimizer works. You can go deeper with it, but for this book, I just want you to be very simple, very straightforward. Okay. So that is what you can do with that. So that's the operating system. And the next thing is the NetScaler. So the second chapter is all about the NetScaler. So, and I, I'm going to say NetScaler forever. It's just, it's just a thing now. Sorry. Citrix ADC is what it's currently called. And so this is primarily focused on things like Citrix Gateway, because again, the target market for this is people that are dealing with Citrix desktops and apps, apps and desktops. Whatever. So that's the primary market. Um, but there's things you should know about the ADC in general that are important to know, like the fact that it, again, it ships just like the Windows operating system does unoptimized. In fact, uh, for the same kind of reasons that you need to be able to get in there and configure it. And if it's locked down out of the box, then you wouldn't be able to configure it. So Citrix is assuming that you are going to lock this down. So very important to lock it down. So that's what chapter two is all about. Just those little things you can do. And I focus on things that are easy to do from the graphical interface. There's a few things that are probably easier to do, not from there, and there's instructions for that on, on my website and on my website and a couple others. 
But the important thing is to know that you, there's some things you need to do uh, for security vulnerabilities and things like that, but also just to make sure that when you go to SSL labs and test your uh, Citrix gateway, yeah, I want to say, Net in fact, I just noticed in the book here, I actually say Netscaler gateway. <laughs> I keep finding these little mistakes and, and I'll just, I'll keep releasing versions of the book until I figure out everything is wrong. <laughs> but uh, getting that rating just kind of indicates your overall outside security. Um, just things inside you should be doing too. And, and I give instructions on those kind of things as well. So those are things that they may not have a user impact, but from a security standpoint, I can tell you right now that the people that have done this are, <laughs> much happier than, than the people that haven't just because there's been some really bad vulnerabilities lately that, that could have been prevented. And um, yeah, th there's a difference. Let's put it that way. Chapter three is about workload placement. Uh, oddly enough of all the chapters, this is probably the one that gets the most people telling me, thank you. And I am not sure why that is, but it sometimes as a consultant, you, forget that the things you see all the time and the information that seems like it's kind of old doesn't really show up. And this is that from the hardware level up matters. And it matters to the degree where, especially if you're running a server OS or what we used to call Zen app, the sizing is, is really important. Like the number of CPUs you have, the amount of Ram that, is really important when it comes to being able to have what we call single server scalability, which means that a single physical host can handle a certain number of users. This should be the target of anybody. And to put this in practical terms, when your CIO or you know, whoever it is that's a VP of technology, whoever at the high level comes up to your desk and asks you, hey, we're gonna add 300 new people what do I need to buy? And you go, oh, some licenses? Wrong answer. You need to be able to say, oh yeah, you need some licenses and you need this amount of hardware and, and, and the specs are laid out because you have properly sized your environment to know just how many users fit on a single physical server and all the other things that are, that are entailed with that. I also go into some detail about some things that are are very commonly not done correctly as far as how many virtual machines should be on a server, host server. And it's it amazes me how often people resist on this and think they just know better. Let me tell you something. When it comes to running a end user computing environment, this stuff matters a lot. And I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> and so one of the reasons I put this in the book is to kind of have that definitive line in the sand and say, look, we know this stuff. Stop messing around with this. This is important. Because every environment that I've ever done this in has had very positive results from just simply being smart about how they're sizing the workloads. And in some cases, we're talking about a single physical host server with only four virtual machines running on it. That sometimes will happen, but that's what is needed for a good user experience. And every Citrix hero should be looking for that good user experience. And is there a fight with that? Every single time, but trust me, it is a factor of, of sometimes 10 or 20 X what you would get if you do it the wrong way. And so it, it is very important. Next chapter is one of my favorite ones. Actually, it's one of my favorite ones to teach because I talk primarily about provisioning services tuning and the role of memory that is in provisioning services, of course. But I go into more detail than most people know about with provisioning services. And it's a shame that most people don't know this, but some of the stories that I tell in this book are about how just adding some memory to PVS servers sometimes will be the difference between, you know, abandoning the technology completely or thriving with it. And there's some, so many stories I could tell you, uh, with leaving the names out, of course, of companies that tuned their PVS properly and had results that were just absolutely astronomical. So I would encourage you to 
read that chapter just for that, just to know about PVS, because it's something that I think a lot of places should be using that aren't. And I know the discussions are always coming about, you know, machine creation services, this, that, and the other. So I'll tell you what, I went ahead and put a discussion about that in there and how you can fine tune machine creation services to be much better than it is. And I actually give some, some examples and some tables of a project that we did, um, I would say a year and a half ago or something like that. Yeah, something like that, where we were able to severely reduce the storage IOPS by using caching in the, in the VM. And I show you the process of how I determined what the point of the amount of cache that was appropriate for that workload. And I show you the, the iterations of that and I figured out, okay, so we need to add, you know, I think in this case, it was like 12 gigs of, of RAM or cache to make this work properly. And it's kind of fun to see this, this tipping point of there's just this point we reached where it's like all of a sudden the sand was barely being used anymore. And in their case, that was a really big deal because it's a kind of an older technology sand and it was being very, very abused. So that is chapter four. We also talked a little bit about the role of memory in the um, caching for the target devices for PVS, but, but that's a lot of fun. So um, I also go into some detail about just how the PVS VDisk works. This is often misunderstood. And so I go into some detail about that as well, but um, and then how caching works and PVS servers, all this kind of fun stuff. So the next chapter is actually really important as well. And this is Active Directory setup for specific to VDI and just virtual ops and desktops in general. And honestly, this is something where it gets missed a lot. And this is a, a point where sometimes people just think that they know best. Well, this is years of experience again, coming into play where I, when I try to say, you know what, there's some structures that work that seem overly complicated until you really look at it and realize that, oh, this gives you a lot of flexibility for the future. Whereas, you know, otherwise you're dealing with things like uh, WMI filters and things like that that don't work well in a virtual environment. Uh, I also, uh, this is actually one of my favorite analogies of the game Plinko, uh, which is something that, uh, <laughs> my now good friend, Nick Rentalin, uh, it kind of nailed out as far as how, how to, how group policies work. And it's like playing pink Plinko is you're figuring out which, which things are going to actually apply to your login. And yeah, so there's a lot of things you can, uh, glean from that. I also go into how processing order works and some do's and don'ts when it comes to group policy. Uh, there's a lot of external references in there. So make sure you check that web page <laughs> uh, to get those latest ones. But related to Active Directory is uh, Workspace Environment Manager or WEM. And so chapter six is all about quick wins with WEM. And it's funny, I was actually having a discussion today with some, some folks I'm helping at a, um, a hospital system in California. And they are really loving Workspace Environment Manager. And I was really glad to, to get them started on it. I think by this point, they probably know more about it than I do. <laughs> it's a lot of fun watching them just thrive with this and then make it into a, a just great product. And you know, honestly, there's a lot you can do with it. But again, in this book, we're really more focused on the very simple things you can do and get big results out of it. And when it comes to Workspace Environment Manager, aside from actually optimizing your, your operating system and sizing it properly. This is probably the biggest impact you can possibly have on the user experience because out of the box with a couple of check boxes and applying it to the, to the, the right machines, you can very quickly go from just kind of the wild west into having your resources under control and can control memory, CPU and things like that to where especially on a server OS. Server OS is really where Workspace Environment Manager really shines because you kind of get the most, best of both worlds. You get the individualized experience that you can do with that, but also you get uh, much more fair sharing of resources and much more practical sharing of resources. WEM has the ability to alter a process's priority to make it so that it can use 100% CPU on idle. Uh, to give you an example, you can see behind me, there's a, uh, a thread ripper on its side. Um, 
and I'm currently punishing it for being bad. And I'm punishing it by running the uh, folding at home client on it, uh, which uses a, uh, it starts as an idle process. So it's running in the background, but it is using 100% of the CPU and GPU whenever it can. And so anything else that comes up gets a higher priority in the CPU scheduler. And modern Windows operating systems, certainly modern, well, any Linux system from for a long time now, has had a very good multi-level scheduler. And modern Windows systems are actually really good about allowing a process to have that changed on the fly without having to restart the process like you used to have to do. So Workspace Environment Manager is able to dynamically assign those uh, priorities. And so that when you have a, a process that's running that should be first and foremost in a system, it's done over those that are that are normally just treated as just anything else. And you get a better experience because of it. You can actually, your CPU might run a little hotter, but you're getting a, a better user experience overall because everything they do that's of proper priority is snappy and uh, always uh, running well, even if the CPU is at 100%. So there's also some learning that has to go into it, some deprogramming of, of the way things work. And so 100% CPU doesn't become necessarily a bad thing. In a desktop environment, this is a little bit different. And so keep that in mind, but still there's controls and things like that you can do to keep it from, keep things from running wild and you can get away with having less RAM per um, virtual machine in that regards. So, so WEM is great. Now the next chapter, I guess you could call it chapter seven. I actually call it a bonus chapter. And the reason why is because we're no longer talking specifically about Citrix at this point. So in the bonus chapter, I'm talking more about change management. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, DJ, why do you talk about change management in a book about technology? And as I mentioned before, I started noticing, and at the back of my mind, this is quite some time ago, but in the last year or so, I've really, really noticed that one of the biggest problems is not in what people know about technology. It's their methods. So it's not your knowledge, it's your methods. So I wanted to focus in on that and explain that to really be a hero, the first thing you want to do, and this is the rule of every hero, is you don't want to cause any harm. I think of the movies in the last few years that have featured any kind of damage done by heroes. I mean, you think of the uh, of, uh, the Avengers series and especially in uh, Captain America Civil War, for example, where there's all these consequences because they had saved the day, but all these people got hurt in the process. So it's like, is that their fault? That sort of thing. And, and it becomes the thing they're wrestling with. And you can see that even with good intentions, bad things happen, but at the same time, is there something they could have done to lower the risk? Is there some way they could have uh, brought the fight somewhere else or done other things, whatever? And so it's with that spirit that, that I put in the book this thing about change management, because if you can have a good balanced process and get the risk away from those that use the system on a daily basis, then you're that kind of behind the scenes hero, the one they never see, they don't even know is there, but somebody important seeing it. And somebody is recognizing that, you know, this was a lot worse before you started doing it this way. You know, they know these things that they do notice. Um, sometimes it might take some reminding, just some gentle nudges, but by and large, that's the way this works. And so the reality is a lot of times people will um, just go out and make a change because somebody's breathing down their neck or they feel it's an emergency or whatever. And then things get worse from there. I tell a story in the book and it's a, it's, a, it's one I tell um, a lot more detail in a presentation that I'm going to hopefully be making available soon on our website, but it really tells the story about how things just can go, not just from bad to worse, but from worse to way worse to everybody's fired. <laughs> and I give a, some further examples of from an upcoming book that I have that nail out kind of the one of the best ways to do it and you can kind of pick and choose how 
how you want to do this, but there's criteria that you should be meeting every time you're doing this. And the core concept here, I'll just tell you this right now, is that you want to make sure that your users are exposed to very little risk early on in your process. So during the development phase, you have a lot of risk, but you don't have any users that are exposed to that risk, right? So then you get into testing and you have to involve some users, right? But you do a very low population because you're starting to lower the risk at that point. And then you go on and you have, you know, user acceptance testing where you have uh, maybe 10% of the population or something like that. But there's a lot lower risk because you've already exposed this to some people and you've made corrections and that sort of thing. But by the time you go to, to actual full production, there should be very little risk. Now, this takes a lot of steps in between and a lot of people don't like taking this, this time. But I can tell you from experience that if you don't take that time and you do expose the users to risks, then you're the one that's going to get fired. So why do it? Always have a, a good plan for change management that in, includes this notion of, you know what, we're not going to expose people to risk. We're going to do this properly. We're going to do this the right way. And this is probably the the drum I'm just going to keep banging until everybody gets it. I mean, this is this is a bigger push button for me than people saying on premises. <laughs> Sorry, on premise, not on premises. <laughs> it's on prem or on premises, but it's not on premise. Premise, is, yeah, I'm just, that's that's an old thing. In fact, I, I make you uh, swear an oath, and you start this whole process that you'll never say on premise. <laughs> on premises again yeah you know what i mean so anyway um <laughs> the joy of going live i can't edit this back out can i <laughs> anyway um i go through my four phase methodology in here with you and give you an intro of that there's a lot more coming about that soon but um but that's the fun part is is kind of setting that up and just kind of giving you that as kind of a bonus that's why i call it a bonus chapter now there is a lot of things other things that i included in the book as an appendix. These are things that were either supplemental information, but a lot of it was just stuff that was like leftovers from chapters that I'd cut out. And I'm like, eh, I kind of still want to include it. So it's not edited as carefully. It's not as well laid out. It's just kind of a information dump of extra stuff. But honestly, I think there's some really good stuff in here, some gold that's in the appendix. So I really hope you uh, get the book and read through that and enjoy doing that um yeah it's just been a great process to to have written this book and to see how people are receiving it and so yeah i just thought i'd give you more information about that so this is available right now on amazon and hopefully you're viewing this before this sale ends but um the arrangement is that this is $10, $10 US or whatever that works out to internationally until um, Sunday, April 26th. So depending on when you see this, it may or may not be still on sale. My guess is it'll probably not be on sale anymore. And I'm sorry for that. But um, the reality is I can't keep it too low a price because the, this has to also go out to uh, catalogs to be bought in stores and things like that, like all, all across the, the the world. And so we have to keep it at the retail price as much as we possibly can. Otherwise it uh, throws that off apparently or something. I'm not 100% sure how that all works. I'm still learning. This is my first book and it's self-published. So that's eh, a bit of a challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot as we go along with this process. I hope it'll be on for the next, but anyway, get it before Sunday and it'll be $10 off the usual um, retail of 1995 uh, US dollars and whatever that works out to in exchange rates. Now, some people have told me that they are having challenges with getting the book in their country. And I have some good news for you. I've just signed last night an agreement with a distribution company that's going to allow me to do a couple things. One is to sell these books more or less directly on our print on demand service. And so you won't have to order these from Amazon. You can actually order from me and or more or less from me, just from a, another spot on my website, basically. Um, the nice thing about that is that I actually end up 
earning more. And the thing that I like about that is the more that I'm earning, the more I'm actually giving to charity. I'm giving 30% of the earnings from the royalties to charity. And so I might talk about that here in a minute, but so that's really good. Uh, so it's the same basic price, but we end up getting more of that share by, by doing it this way. Um, the only drawback is that they won't be eligible for prime shipping, which is kind of a bummer, but, um, but that's okay. But the good news is that you'll be able to order this internationally from a multitude of sellers, including uh, actually through Amazon um, directly, you can get it uh, in other markets and, and in the next few months, um, you'll be able to get it um, through some resellers if they choose to carry it. Like for example, Barnes and Noble, you can go request a copy of, of, of this. I'll have some information on the website soon. If they, if they can't find it by title, there's a number they can look up to, uh, to find that book. And so you can take that in there and, and order it from like Barnes and Noble and that sort of, sort of thing. And so that's going to be possible. Um, we make pretty much nothing on that, but I wanted to make sure this was in many hands as possible and as many ways as possible. So if it takes putting it on shelves, we'll do it. The other way you'll be able to do it is to just order directly from this company and they'll be able to send it to you. Um, there's a delay because it is print on demand. So it's same thing with Amazon. It is a, there's a, print delay, uh, especially right now during the, the coronavirus thing going on. It's causing a lot of priorities to be shifted as far as what ships and what doesn't. And, and the printing process in general is taking longer. And so, you know, unfortunately it does take a little bit, but it's not, not horrible, but um, at least it's available. Now on Amazon Kindle, it'll be, it's available now. Actually it, it was unavailable on Kindle first before I put it on print at all. It wasn't until people really told me they wanted a print version that I even considered it. I originally was just going to do this just on Kindle, but through this new international availability, um, it will soon be available on more than just Kindle for electronic platforms. And so we're talking like Apple books, um, Nook, uh, some of the other readers out there. And so that's something else we're working on if there's enough demand for that. Now that's, just, that's something that if, if there is demand for a electronic platform other than, than Kindle, go ahead and just say something in the comments and I'll, I'll get a note for it or just email me coach DJ at DJ at, uh, sorry, coach DJ at ctxpro.com. <laughs> um, yeah. Just send me a message on that and let me know you want it in another format. There's some work we have to do for that, but that's something we can do now. Something else special just came along is the ability to get signed copies. Now, let me caveat this with this. There's only North America for this right now. We're still getting international shipping figured out. The last we checked uh, for an example <laughs> to send a single book to New Zealand was going to cost us $150. We need another method. So uh, unfortunately right now, this is only in the, in North America, the, the kind of NAFTA, uh, which means Mexico, America, and Canada are the only places that's going to be uh, available as a signed copy. How this works is you'll order from me directly. Um, it'll just be a PayPal kind of thing, or I think Stripe, uh, whatever we figure out on that. But there'll be a way to just order that directly. You'll give me your sh shipping address. I'll sign a copy. Um, slip a little something extra in there for you and send it on to you. Uh, so those are going to be available coming in the next week, I think. So look for that on the website soon. If you really want to sign copy of that. Uh, another thing that's going to come along with that is the ability for you to say, Hey manager, why don't you buy a bunch of these for your team? So, so that everybody has one. Uh, so I've already got a order or two of these that are in, in bulk coming in. And so depending on the quantity, we have some special pricing that we can do and some things like that. But also this means that I'm processing these orders. It's not necessarily processed through another source. And so there's an, a second ability to have the signed copies sent to you. Again, North America only for the signed copies. But uh, let's say you're in the Netherlands and you have a, um, a, a team of 20 people. You know, I'll, I'll probably be able to get you a special price. I'm not sure how much that works out to exactly, but uh, I'll, I'll be able to quote you a special price on that and, and send that even internationally, but it just won't be signed. But uh, yeah, that's going to be a cool thing. Uh, 
again, coming up in the next week or so, I'll have that all figured out logistically and have that available. If you want to get in on it early, just send me a message and I'll get back to you. So that's for teams. So yeah, go buy Be a Citrix Hero on print and Kindle today and soon on multiple international formats and other readers and all that kind of stuff. Can't wait to see you out there. Um, let me talk one thing else about this. And that is that there are some bonuses that come along with the book that is available for everybody who has a copy. It uh, doesn't really matter how you got it, just the things that go along with it, including some, some full color things that are in PDF. I'm working on a kind of a uh, activation guide, I guess you could call it, or like a checklist kind of a thing. But there's also all these videos I talked about. And so I'm going to be making these uh, available for people that are uh, registered online uh, with my mail list, basically. I'll be emailing those out when they're available. So, so register for those bonuses as well on ctxpro.com. And I'll make sure that you get those bonuses when they're available. Um, one thing I will say about that, when you do register, it's really important to make sure that we're in your your trusted contacts, whatever. So support at ctxpro.com needs to be in your contacts or your trusted contacts. Otherwise you might not get some of these messages that go out um, just because of eh, keyword filtering and stuff like that. Um, some people use their work address, which is a pretty big mistake. <laughs> Those just don't get get there as often. So just use your personal address and make sure you add it as a, as a contact so you get those. But as far as the bonuses go, there's also something that I just bought yesterday that's going to allow me to let you basically borrow a copy of the audiobook or even buy it if you want to buy it uh, to get a copy after you've borrowed it. But, um, and also be able to um, rent out an electronic copy, that sort of thing. There's a lot of things that are, that are coming with this that are uh, going to be kind of cool. And so that's something that I'll be working on in the coming month or so. It's going to take a little while, but uh, you know, we'll get that going. So that's really exciting too. But also, like I mentioned before, uh, all the courses, um, there's some that will just be available as a direct bonus and some additional ones that are going to be available at a uh, kind of a beta rate. These are lessons that I want to take from their current format and reshoot them as more of a course. And so you're going to be able to get a very special rate on those uh, course materials, as well as some additional things that are coming down the pipeline. As far as that goes, you're going to have some exclusive uh, ability to not only get discounts, but be kind of first to see these things. And whenever I do something like that, I always give the first people, first people to see it a discount because there's usually, you know, it's kind of that, I, we call it muddy boots pricing. In other words, when you buy a house that's being manufactured and there's other houses being manufactured all around you, Usually the lawn is really nasty or it doesn't exist yet. And so you get muddy when you're coming in the door. So it's muddy boots pricing. So that's the, you get a discount on that house usually because you're willing to move in while they're still working on everything else. So that's what I do with courses as well as I say, okay, because we're kind of still in development phase with a lot of this and still seeking feedback, we're going to give you a much better price, but that's only if you're part of the bonuses for Citrix hero that you're going to get access to this that kind of early access muddy boots pricing. So just so you know, there's a little bit of an incentive for you to, to get in there. Um, a little bit of incentive. Yeah. I'm, I'm literally talking hundreds and hundreds of dollars off of a course price. So it actually makes a lot of sense. And I hope a lot of people take me up on the offer uh, because <laughs> honestly um, the feedback's worth it for me. So it's, it's been great. Uh, so that's about it for me. I think I'm, I'm, and, and that 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 kind of it's friday here so it's uh kind of i'm done <laughs> it's like go oh, you've stayed your hour <laughs> anyway i'm out of here guys uh if you have any questions please let me know leave me a comment or uh, message me directly and we will see you out there look for another live broadcast coming next week